And drink it. We're going to have to get started with the, our next kind of part of the program. As I mentioned, one of the things that we're really excited about and happy to, to have the three representatives from Rawlings here with us, including Eric Reinsfelder, who's the Senior Vice President of Marketing for Rawlings, is with us. And I have to share my first Rawlings story, first of all, before we get started, because I still have this with me. I was a Cardinal fan growing up. 1964, World Series, of course, great time. I was in the third grade. Made sure that after that year, I don't know if they still do this or not, our Rawlings brought out an MVP edition of whoever the MVP, their glove for the next season. So I still have my 1965 MVP Ken Boyer glove in my closet. So there's not very much padding in it anymore. Whenever I had to play catch with Mike or his brother BJ, my hand did hurt for a while, but I do still have my Rawlings glove, How many years ago that was. So. Uh, Eric, I want, uh, the one thing that I think that has really exciting, uh, everybody in St. Louis, and I hope everybody in this room gets a chance to do it, is the new Rawlings experience that's coming out to Westport Plaza. Maybe we can chat about yeah, that for sure. a second. Um, is this on? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, thanks for sharing that story, and I think that emotional connection is what we love about the brand. And, you know, St. Louis is a, is a sports town, a baseball town. Um, uh, generational baseball town, generational fans, just like we feel Rawlings is a generational company. I'm glad it wasn't uh, a St. Louis Brown story. But if I didn't that far, I'm yeah. not that old, sorry. Yeah. I'm getting there, but not yet. Yeah, so for, uh, for Rawlings, um, we're pretty excited. You know, we've been in St. Louis since 1887, 137 years. A lot of people don't know we're here. About two years ago, we made a decision to um, move our offices um, to the Westport area. Um, and with that, that was sort of the catalyst to kind of create more of a, a campus. And we decided we wanted to not only open the new offices, but also open a retail experience at Westport um, to get our brand out there in a bigger way. So it's a really neat brand experience that we think will be an attraction for St. Louis that people will hopefully come that aren't here that will want to come and see the zoo and the brewery and the arch and the Rawlings experience. And it'll be a, a mixture of things from, you know, a brand perspective. Um, there'll be uh, a glove vault where you know, we'll talk about the history and some really neat things about the Rawlings Gold Glove Award um, that was established in 1957. We'll have a batting cage where um, kids can get fitted for the right bat that they need to swing, that type of thing. And I know one of the things about it, too, is that the grand opening is coming up. April's, April 12th. April 12th. And, and is there going to be like, it, uh, is it like one, one admission price and then you get it? Yeah, so good, good question. And we get that a lot. But um, it's sort of part museum, part store, part interactive, if you will. So there is no cost of admission. Everything is free to, to, to come in. You can um, see some of the products that'll be for sale. We'll have some really unique one of one type of gloves that will be for sale and in the glove vault as well. Um, but there's no cost. We have a really cool history timeline as well that, uh, that we're building out. Um, so you can come and just, just experience it. So our grand opening is April 12th, that little flyer in front of you. Um, I think it has a QR code for, for a discount, 20% um, off. So please feel free to join us on April 12th for the grand opening out at Westport. We have a full day of festivity planned and we'd love to have you out. I know one of the cool things that they had planned, and I'm not sure what the status of it is now, is they're going to put a giant gold glove on top of the roof. If you know that building out there? But I know it ran into a little problems with the FAA. So. <laughs> sort of, yeah. Um, yeah, so we are, we are uh, you'll see when you come to the experience, there's a, a giant gold baseball out in front of the store. There's other, there's a, a, a giant glove inside the store. There's a big cutaway ball inside the store. You can see the insides of a baseball. Um, but we are going to put a 30-foot tall gold glove on top of our gold building. Um, which is exciting, but it is an engineering marvel. It's, uh, we're putting a 21,000 pound glove on top of a 12 story building, so it's like a building on a building. So it's a project. And I guess the problem with the FAA was the glare, right? Off the, off no. The, oh, was it? No, no. <laughs> really just, um, not to get too technical, but um, I think it's distance to the runway, nearest runway. It's actually not Lambert, it's Creek Core. Oh, okay. um, but we're, we're all clear to have approval. We just have to put a little blinking light up there. And we're good. <laughs> they don't fit it. Good. Yeah. Anybody have any questions about the uh, the Rawlings experience? If we look forward to we'll see. I think, oh, we got one in the back. So, um, 
Could you, so I know Westport yeah. pretty Is well. Could you there? tell us where exactly is our renovating out there? Yes. I mean, are you close to uh, yeah, Sheridan sure. or like sure. where? Yeah, a great question. Hopefully everybody heard that, but you know, where are we located at Westport? If you haven't been to Westport in a while, and I think just looking around the room at the, at the age of most people here, you know, it was a happening place 25 years ago. It was really, really cool, right? And then it sort of died off over the last 25 years. Well, it's going through this resurgence, and uh, um, they just put uh, bar 360 at the top of our gold building. That's a um, kind of a swanky bar and uh, great appetizers and food and um, great views. Um, they uh, put in a soda fountain, they're uh, redoing the hotels. Um, the space that we're going into is kind of in the middle of the plaza, um, sort of uh, next to the gold building, if you will, and by the atrium there. Um, it was the old Casa Gallardo, and then there was a dueling piano bar up above. So it's 14,000 square feet on two floors. So we have two, two levels, and we've got an opening in the, in the floor, so you can uh, you know, see upstairs and, and make your way upstairs. So, um, yeah, it's going, Westport is going through a great revitalization. Um, there'll be lots to do. We will have a giant TV screen on the front as well. Um, LHM that, that owns Westport um, leveled about an acre's worth of buildings right in front of our store and created a green space where they will begin to host parties in the plaza again. Um, on our giant TV, we'll have some watch parties, maybe a Field of Dreams or Bad News Bears or Sandlot, something like that, bring families out. Um, we'll do cardinal watch parties, people can come out. There'll be some new restaurants going in over the next year as well that um, I think will bring people to Westport as a whole, so we're, we're excited about where we are. Well, we're excited to have those guys with us now as a sponsor on the website. And again, as is the case with Archwell Health, if you don't remember anything else, you can go to the, when you go to the homepage, stlsportspage.com, there's a Rollins ad is there, you can just click, click there, and it'll link you back to the Rollins experience. So thank you again for coming, and appreciate it. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I had a question. Uh, do you have event space inside, or just event space outside, or how? Yeah, good, good question on event space. Um, so really, um, not for events at this point, but we may, we will host a lot of things there, right? We'll have pro player visits, we'll do glove care and repair day, we'll do hitting clinics, we'll do all those kinds of things uh, in there, but it's not, not available to kind of lease out, but we will create events out in that green space I'm as well. STL but, sports yeah, I mean, you know, there. eventually, yes, I think we'll be able to, to do something like that, you know, it'll be conducive to, to, to have some things like that. Mm -hmm. um, we've been asked by, by a couple uh, groups to do that, but we'd love to have STL Sports page there um, and, and do something like that and appreciate all you're doing and happy to happy to sponsor you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Eric coming. Brian Sauer coming. Thank you. 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 Thank all right, we're going to turn the attention to uh, the fact that it's opening day. Happy New Year, everybody. Uh, we did see one so one T-shirt in Florida, which I thought uh, Sally got, well, almost tried to buy it off the guy um, while he was wearing it. it was a, it's really, what was it? It's not, happy, it's, it's not really Happy New Year until pitchers and catchers report. So, so I think that was good. So, Mike, you want to get your uh, breaking news out first and we can uh, share that information? Breaking news from the uh, I didn't know what my breaking news was. Dodger yeah. Stadium, there can be the first. First of all, let's see here, report this. See your lineup for today. Donovan in left, Goldie at first, Gorman at second, Arnado batting cleanup third, Contreras catching, Burleson DH, Walker in right, Victor Scott making the start in center field, Mason Wynn at short, and Michael is on the mound. Is that a winning lineup or not? Yes. Yeah. My, we don't. We were, as I mentioned, Victor Scott II was one of our guests at the uh, at the party, and I, I mean, I, I've known Dylan Carlson since he was drafted by the Cardinals, so I, and I like him. I'm good friends with his dad, so I really feel sorry that he's not playing. But I think it is exciting to have Victor Scott out there to, to playing, and, and he's a great kid. And I think he's going to do really well. But you were looking up one thing about him today that I think was interesting. Yeah, I, I do have one question for anybody in the room. Does anybody have a clue how many total stolen bases the Cardinals had last year as a team? Any guesses? They had 101. And how many? That was 162 games. And the Victor Scott in 120 games had 94. So, so that tells you a little bit of how the game's going to change. Well, hopefully. The, the two things that I'm worried about, about with Victor Scott is that, number one, he has to hit. And I would say, you know, he has to have a game of, of major league experience. That would give him my triple-A experience. He puts, he's played 163 games in the minor leagues in his career. As recently as June 25th of last year, he was playing in Peter Oregon. 
So, I mean, that's a pretty big, quick rise. So he has to be able to hit enough to get on base. And then I'm just really worried that the Cardinals are not going to turn him loose once he gets on base and let him run. Like, the, you know, the 80s Cardinals did with, with Vance Lowy and some of those guys. I would think they have to test it. They have to let him run a little bit, right? Um, he talked at our baseball baseball bash down in spring training about how the ability to throw over to first base to pick up attempts has really helped him because now that once they throw over twice, he knows, okay, I can go on this next one. And it, it really took off a lot. So I think with his speed, you got to try because you've got to create some offense because this team needs it. And even though he's sitting eighth or ninth in the lineup, too, I think he still have that opportunity to get on base and, and uh, you know, be there when some of the other guys come up to bat. So. Uh, it'll be it'll be interesting. It'll be exciting. I think it, it's something everybody's looking forward to a little bit. Um, the other way is, and hopefully everybody's had a chance. Everybody's had a chance to listen to the podcast, and Mike, Mike's done a great job with us on the podcast. So I appreciate him being involved with us, and just in general, thanks for everybody for for reading the website, reading the newsletter. You wouldn't be here if you uh, if you didn't do that. So we appreciate everybody and spread the word. Still, we're still trying to grow and become a bigger outlet and do more things. We got some good ideas for the future going forward. So appreciate everybody's uh, support with that. We, one thing we forgot to talk about, even though we kind of made our predictions a little bit on this week's podcast, was the win totals, predictions of how many wins do you think the Cardinals are going to win this year. And I think Why is everybody pulling that for? <laughs> this team's not going to lose 91 games, okay? I think a lot of people are worried about that, but the additions they made, this team's not going to lose 91 games. And if you're looking at the competition throughout, the Cubs are probably your only competition in this division, right? The, the Brewers are trading a lot of people away. They've done a lot of different things. The Reds are young, so if they play like they can, they're capable of it. And I have no idea what the Pirates are doing. So They'll be better. They'll be better. I, I think one of the things I saw last year, one comment on Twitter, which or X, if we want to be correct, about the new name. <laughs> I still can't figure that out. But anyway, um, somebody said when the Cardinals were going through their one of their slumps in July, August, now I know what it feels like to be a Reds or a Pirates fan. <laughs> so that was a pretty good, pretty good line. So, so what's your total number of wins prediction? My number is 88. When you go through this schedule and you look at the division, I think this team will finish with 88 wins and the Cubs with 86. Over or under 88 wins? Anybody? Who's over? Over. Over? over? Under. 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 That's pretty. All right. How many over? Let's go. How many over? 88. How many under 88? Uh, is under 88 going to be enough to win the division? It can be. I think, and I'll say this, I don't, I don't know how many wins they're going to end up having, but I think I saw one prediction, one of the different predictions was that all five teams in the NL Central will be within five games of each other at the end of the season. Yeah. So that would be one exciting race. That is the one back great right baseball, but exciting race. As we talked about before, does, NL Central is one of the weaker divisions, so it is kind of the benefit that we have, so to speak. But we also want to see this team not just – get to the postseason and go farther once they get in. Let's open up to some questions. Who's got questions that we can either fib about or tell you the truth or answer or <laughs> make up a story, you know, whatever. Who's got who's got a comment or a comment? Who who's uh, who who has ninety wins on the Cardinal prediction? Who thinks they're gonna get to ninety this year? Nobody. Okay. <laughs> so over eighty eight you didn't stretch it by too far. <laughs> Here, I'll, I'll ask a question though. So um do you think Lance Lynn will have? <laughs> I think the biggest question mark is which Lance Lynn shows up, right? The Lance Lynn of the last couple years, you're probably hoping that he's, you know, 10 to 12, but if we get the Lance Lynn that we've seen before, 12 to 15, and, you know, you get 15 wins out of your starting pitcher, you're probably looking pretty good, right? I think that's one of the questions that, the Cardinal, that, that everybody kind of has is just how good is the starting rotation going to be? Because of the fact that, you know, that, okay, they added Sonny Gray, they added Lance Lane, they added Kyle Gibson, but they didn't really get a guy that I think everybody's like saying, wow, we got that guy. You know, and I think that's what people wanted was that guy. And we didn't get that guy. But I think so, they've also revamped the bullpen too. And when you look at last season, a lot of these starting pitchers were only lasting four, five, maybe six innings. And so the three new pitchers you picked up all typically go into the seventh and eighth inning, which is going to make a big difference on this bullpen as well. The other thing about two about wins is that, you know, in this age of analytics and sabermetrics and whatever you want to call it, it, it I, I do think that the number of wins for a starting pitcher has been devalued. I don't think that people look at the, you know, oh, this guy's the best pitcher in baseball because he won 20 games. You know, that the era of, of, you know, kind of like we've talked about before, different plays, eras of baseball that change, statistics change. But, you know, to me, wins are still valuable statistics. And, and I think that, you know, for this, 
Cardinals to be an effective club, like Sonny Gray, for example, has to probably win close to 20 games. I mean, I don't, you know, you can devalue wins all you want, but but I think, you know, that shoot proves that he was in the ball games, that he's proving that the team won ball games, and that he, you know, kept it, his, uh, was able to pitch. You know, I, I would say that the most, best ability in baseball is availability. And I think that that's one of the things that, that Sonny Gray's going to prove right now is that he can get back there and, and pitch well. So. And the other thing, too, is you look at Kyle Gibson, who finished second in the American League last year and wins. So you want to talk about his ERA, you want to talk about some other numbers. Well, if you're looking at the value of did he give us a quality start of six innings to get that win, he did that the majority of the time. And you're so look at the fact that he also led the American League hits a lot. He did that too. <laughs> <laughs> who else? Who else got some questions? Is Steve Matt's looking better this year? Oh, he looks okay. He's a nice looking guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you've been pitching one. Oh, oh okay. Um, no, I think he had a pretty good spring. I mean, they, they brought him along a little slowly. They want to make sure he could try to keep him healthy. But I think especially that last start he had in Arizona on, on Monday, I, I thought he pitched okay. So you know, the interesting thing to me about the rotation is going to be, uh, as we kind of joking aside, the, the uh, expectation is that Gray's going to probably only miss a couple of starts. And he could be back as early as this end of his first home stand. So then, you know, Thompson is kind of taking that spot in the rotation to start with. So uh, you're curious to see what happens when Gray comes back. Because obviously they could stay as five starters. They could go to six and keep Thompson. But if Thompson, the way he pitched this spring, he and Michaels were the two best starters, I thought, this spring. If he pitches well his first two times on this road trip, they have a hard time taking him out of the rotation. So it'll be interesting to see what they do then. So. Yes, sir. Uh, in your talks with Ollie, has he indicated he may leave pitchers in longer this year? Or, or is no. that kind of the... <laughs> but, I mean, no, I mean, I think, you know, he's, he's a new era manager. You know, I think he, he does have a feeling that uh, the whole thing about trying to face a hitter for the third time is, is uh, you know, a is a thing. And that, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how he adjusts to that. I do think he likes the fact that he's got veteran, more veteran pitchers. <clears throat> That have a track record of going deeper into a ball game. You know, it, it's funny. I, rem I remember a story, a, a book I was doing years ago. Uh, kind of where are they now? A book on the 1982 Cardinals, and David Point was a rookie pitcher on that team. And, we, and I think this is irrelevant to, to what we're talking about. He was he said, and I don't remember who now who they were facing or what the opponent was, but it was somebody who was a really good hitter, somebody who's like you know established there in the league. And well, Point's like throwing him, you know, every different pitch he has in like the, a situation with like two outs and nobody on base or whatever early in the ball game. And he said, he told me the story later, he said Keith Hernandez came up to him in the dugout after that inning and like grabbed him by the neck and was pushing him against the wall. He said, what are you doing? And he's like, what are you doing? Goes, Why did you throw those pitches to him in that situation? You didn't need to do that. Just throw a fastball there. You know, what are you going to, now what are you going to, you know, sixth inning, seventh inning, he comes up, tying on a base, two by the, you know, two outs. What are you going to throw him then? He's already seen that pitch. And so I think it was a, it was an education that they said he never forgot. And I think maybe sometimes the young pitchers and stuff don't. They, maybe that's part of the problem yeah. about going deeper in the ball games is they don't think that I've got to get. I, I can't. I'm going to face this guy three times. I'm going to face this guy four times. I may face him in a different situation. So they have to have kind of something in reserve that the guy's not expecting. And this team really relies on the analytics. And so if the numbers tell them, hey, your batting average goes down third time through or fourth time through, et cetera, that's really what they focus on. And so I also think that as they look at analyzing the new pitchers they have too in Gray, Gibson, and Lynn, you know, it's going to be a difference to see how long they let them go too. Who else got a question? Come on, you guys came here to the Cardinal fans. Sandy again? Yeah, I've got another question. Yeah. Uh, so when we're talking about pitching, uh, Montgomery's still out there. Could you give me a signed with the diamond back. Back. Yeah. When was that? Uh, two days ago. Two days ago. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I guess I have been reading that. <laughs> <laughs> he, was he was out there until a couple days ago. Yeah, so it, okay, it, I think so a lot of people kind of wanted him to come back here. Yeah, but, okay. and, and the contract well, wasn't exorbitant. But, do you think the addition of Brandon Crawford will be a good one for the team since he is a veteran? Yeah, I do. I think he, he and Mason have developed a pretty good relationship, it seems, already. And, and uh, Mason seems like he's he's approachable to ask questions. And I think Crawford understood the role when he came here. And I think he's going to get a chance to play a little bit. But I think, you know, I think the, the one kind of addition like that that maybe surprised people is I think Matt Carpenter is going to actually help this club. And I mean, I, I think maybe before, I, I admit when I first saw the uh, press release come through on the, on the email the day they signed him, I went, Wait, what? You know, and then 
you know, first of all, you make sure it's not a fake account to send the email, and then and then you make sure that it's not he's signing a ceremonial, you know, one day contract to retire as a cardinal, and then he went. I guess this is for real, you know. So, uh, but but he had a great spring, and I think you know he, you know, I did a story on him, and we had a nice little chat, and he's like, you know, the the least thing I'm thinking about is me, and I think that that's really helped kind of free him up mentally and and physically. That I think he's gonna gonna play maybe more than some people expected, and I think he's gonna play a role even uh, even when he doesn't play, and, and that's gonna help this club. And I and I think Crawford would be in that same category. So. I think Crawford is very much a guy that I would compare to like Paul Goldschmidt. They're very quiet, they go about their business, but they're eager to help the young guys behind closed doors. So like, they're gonna be there to help them, they're just not gonna be out front and center in front of people talking about us. You may not know as much, but I think Crawford's gonna be a big addition to that clubhouse. For those of you who may not know, Mike used to work at Rawlings for a while, and had a lot of interactions with a lot of players, including Brandon Crawford, in some of the videos and stuff that they shot for Rawlings. So you've got kind of some insight into some of these. A little inside track, but yes, very nice guy. Who else got some questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, as far as the mentorship, would it have, was the audio at spring training, or what's that? Uh, that would be a no. <laughs> um, and I don't really know. I mean, they, you know, we, we thought early on we'd go see him. Then we thought, you know, that the expectation was he'd be there by the end of March. And um, if he came, and I didn't see him. Um, so I, I think that's an interesting story to kind of monitor as to exactly what his, you know, his situation with the club is going to be. I mean, his situation, I could, I could basically honestly say, his situation is going to be whatever he wants it to be. Right. Um, you know, if he show, wants to show up, he'll show up. And if he doesn't want to show up, I don't think he'll be there. So, it'll be, uh, you know, he may be having conversations on the phone or text or something like that with Wilson or with some of the, you know, Herrera or some of the other catchers that we're not aware of. So even though he's, physically he's not present, but he was not present in his picture. What about the management? <laughs> I mean, you know, the management. Yes, the manager oh. and upper people, lists and things like that. You think oh. if hopefully not, we do well. But if we don't do well in these first couple months, yeah, I, I don't really anticipate anything major happening during the season, even yeah. if the team is struggling. Um, I think one of the reasons they signed Ollie to the extension was to kind of take that pressure off of them a little bit so that they wouldn't have to be answering questions if they you know if they start the year three and ten or something like that on this road trip which with the hard schedule they have in april with the injuries i mean it's entirely possible that they they struggle out of the gate um but i don't think that's a if i think basically if they get through april playing 500 they'll be in, in good shape um but i think that you know that that was part of the reason for that move but i also think if you get into july and august and the team is real bad signing that contract extension is not going to help them you know they have, i think they've done you know, they've shown in the past that that's not going to stand in the way. But if this club, I will say this, if this club, I don't know what Mike's opinion on this is, but to me, my opinion is if this club does for some reason have another really bad year, I don't know that you'll recognize this club or the front office at this time next year. I think there will be massive changes. And I would think that, that Mo is very analytical driven. And so that's where his trust in Ollie has come because Ollie shows that he follows the way. And just because he signed an extension, that didn't work out for Schilt very well, right? Yeah. So. I don't think they're concerned about that. Uh, but I also think, too, that it's probably more on Mo this year than it is on Ollie because he's the one who put this team together. He's the one who built it the way that it is. And so if this team can't win again because of that, then there's going to be a lot of change in the front office. Time right. for a couple more. Yes. Which Cardinal do you think is the most charismatic? <laughs> Charismatic. You know, like the leadership, keep level headed. Well, Goldschmidt's probably the most level headed because he doesn't get emotional, he doesn't get too high, he doesn't get too low. I mean, he's, he's uh, you know, very much a, a guy that wants to that wants to win, wants to play hard. He's also a guy that is very, you know, I think behind the scenes talking to his teammates. He's not a guy that's going to ever grab a microphone and talk about himself. Um, I think Brendan Donovan's actually more of a guy that's going to be that emotional leader of this club. And I think he was a guy that this team really missed a year ago, was having him in the lineup. So having him back healthy, I think he's going to make a difference to the club. And I think especially as he gets a little bit older uh, and step, more established in the league, even though he's established himself now, he's still a relatively young player. I think he's going to probably become kind of the guy that is the guy we talk about with this club. 
Yeah, I think Donovan would have been my answer too. I think he's the guy who's going to come through. It shows I've taught you well. Yeah, has to be the guy. <laughs> Not to say that we have disagreements about stuff, because we do. Usually we have disagreements when you're trying to set your fantasy lineup for the Generally, or when I'm teaching you about the BAPIP of somebody or their what? hard hit percentage or their whatever other analytics that we're discussing is. Yes. Okay. Anybody else? Good questions? So, well, we're always talking about you cover the minor leagues and we go to Memphis and Springfield a lot. Could you just tell them a little bit like how easy it is to go to those games and how fun it is, how you see the players and stuff? Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, the access is, is great. I mean, as far as there's usually smaller like crowds. If anybody wants to go, yeah. Yeah, and when you have, you know, pro covers, it's really kind of fun to see these guys and kind of get the minor league level and predict, you know, who's going to be a, a star when they get to the big league level and kind of get to know them. And one of, one of the things that you know, I've done, have tried to do, and I think it's worked out well, is that because we do get to know some of these players when they're, you know, in, the, in rookie ball, I mean, I first met Nolan Gorman in Johnson City, Tennessee, um, you know, when he was first drafted with the club. So it, it does help you kind of later on as I, as I grow up. It's, it is fun to watch these guys, and even in Peoria or Springfield, and say, I remember, you know, when they get the big ones, I remember watching him at that at that level. And the ch tickets are cheaper, number one. Concession stand prices are cheaper. So it's, and it's, it's you know, the entertainment value is, is there. It's, it's fun. It's, it's a good trip. There's a lot of other stuff to do. And, in all the cities where the Cardinals have minor league clubs. So. Although I am sad that Johnson City is no longer there. <laughs> Johnson City, Tennessee. <laughs> it, uh, we, what, what was the last time we were I guess it was 2016 or whatever when, when no one was drafted. was the last time we were there. It's now no longer a Cardinal Farm Club. When they restructured the minor leagues, they did away with that club and the, also the club in State College, Pennsylvania, which is now – there are other, like, uh, summer program, uh, like a baseball MLB development league, but they're not affiliated with the – Cardinals team anymore, but uh, but back the first trip that we were ever in Johnson City, Tennessee was in 1983, 1984, somewhere in that range. This ballpark, as a throwback to old minor league ballparks, they've been at Cardinals Farm Club since the 1940s or whatever. In right field, they did not have a fence. They had a hedge. <laughs> and, it, and it was up the top of a hill. So it was uh, it was quite exciting. But when we well, were Oh, well, well, that, okay, but when we went back in about, you know, like 2016 or whatever it was, they had managed to take out the hill, same location, but they had managed to take out the hill and the hedge and put up a fence. So, but, but, but no ticket office. The ticket office was a cardboard table in front of the, in front of the whole, you know. Pop was he was selling your tickets, he was taking your ticket, and he was checking in for security, too, I think. And when you talk about the raw, rawest of levels of professional baseball, that, too, that was it. You know, they, they were, uh, either that or you know the other the other great places that is everybody's been to Roger Dean and the, the Chevrolet Stadium complex. If you go back to the back fields, field one, which is the stadium, the field right directly behind the clubhouse and the bullpens and, and pitching mounts, all that kind of stuff. That's where the what they call the complex league team plays now. It used to be Florida Gulf Coast League, but now they call it the complex league. They play their games there at one o'clock in the afternoon in July, oh, wow. and it's hot. And you've got, you know, about three people in the stands watching, you know, whoever's girlfriend happens to be there, maybe, maybe a mom or dad, that's it. I mean, there are guys playing in that league who had played at Division I college baseball tournaments or in front of 10,000 fans or been to the College World Series in Omaha playing in front of however many people. And they're playing, trying to, to prove that they're ready to move up to the next level in that environment. I mean, you talk about, you know, people forget, I think, sometimes about how hard it is. You, you see guys playing at the major league level. But you forget how hard it is to get there. I mean, what you have to go through, the, the you know, the conditions like that to play and the, you know, motiv that you have to basically motivate yourself. There's no one else there to motivate you to succeed. And the guys that, that do it and succeed there and kind of come up through the, the ranks, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, it, it is exciting to see them and, and they're to be rewarded and to be credited for, for their accomplishments of doing that. So. Want to do some more attendance prizes? Oh, we got another question. Sorry. I just had a comment. Um, Goldschmidt is going to look very good in spring training. That's a polite way to say it. <laughs> and he always has a slow start, but hopefully this is his slow start before he... Yeah, I, I, I hope you're right, too. Yeah, he had, a, he had a double the other day, which was you know, a positive sign. Um, yeah, he was not very good this spring. And absolutely, you know, I think I think one thing about last year too, and we, we talked about this with, with Nolan Arenado as well. If you just looked at their raw statistics, home runs, RBIs, they weren't that bad. 
but they weren't as good as people expected. And they already kind of talked about what a down year it was for them. But I'll say this, and I've said this in, in, on other radio stations, and I've said it in, in print as well. They're wrong. I guess, can you still call it print when it's a digital platform? I don't know. But anyway, I guess you could print it out and read it. But um, I'm a newspaper guy, you know, it's just like, I call it print. Um, but I think it's, it's um, this club, as, as many good young players as they have, the young players, I thought, and I saw one stat already about the opening day lineup, the Cardinals will have four players starting today, 23 years of age or younger. The last time they had four players, 23 or younger, in their opening day starting lineup, 1924, exactly 100 years ago. And I think that's what shows you that how important Goldie and Arnado well, are. That's what I was going in. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, I, this, that's what I'm going to say. Was basically, if this club is going to be better than they were a year ago, and better in terms of being able to be in the, in the race, it's going to start with Goldschmidt and Arnado. They, they have to be the guys that this club builds around. And that's because they made their, their bets on kind of like Sonny Gray. They made their biggest bet on Sonny Gray being their ace. And for them to be successful, he has to be an ace. So, so on the Goldschmidt part, since we have brought Mr. Rawlings here, <laughs> um, I'm here not me. I wonder, <laughs> when he first redesigned his bat, he was lights out. And then last year it wasn't as successful. Could it be that he needs to go back to a traditional Rawlings bat, maybe a little lighter based on his age than this big, heavy, whatever? You're hired. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we're, we're working on it. We're working. He uses our gloves and not our bat. But, so, but I mean, has anyone talked to him about <laughs> this bat situation? Because, I mean, his statistics this spring were as you said, it really yeah, the, horrible. The, the, the you know, White Hairs at one time said the tough, two toughest times to judge a player are September and March. And so I, I think it, you know, especially with a veteran player, we'll talk about this with the veteran pitchers the Cardinals have signed, I don't really get too caught up in spring training statistics and their performance because you never know what the situation is. I mean, Kyle Gibson in Florida was yeah. awful. I mean, as far as if you just looked at the raw numbers. But like when we were talking to him one day after the game, he's talking about how he threw the same pitch on three consecutive pitches because he was trying to get the field for it, trying to get it right. And he's like, and one of the, the third one I think was a home run. So, you know, he said like, I would never do that in a regular season game. You know, I mean, there's no way that that pitch sequence would, would happen. So so that's why you kind of have to throw out some of the statistics. And so I, as far as like Goldschmidt is concerned, we don't, I don't know if he had something specific that he was trying to do differently, you know, that, that he, and you get, so you kind of almost have to give those guys the benefit of the doubt because of their track record at this point, you know. Uh, uh, that me? No. Oh, not me. Okay, sound on my ring. Uh, but anyway, so, so so let's see. You know, I mean, he has to do it now. I mean, there's no no uh, no more time. It's go time. You know, so I mean, we'll find out if he can. You know, if those spring training statistics didn't mean something, and that he, you know, sometimes you know the, the one thing about players too, and I'm not saying this is the case with Goldsmith, but we have seen it with other players not only the Cardinals, but with other teams as well, is age is a funny thing. You know, I mean, sometimes you can get old and hurt. You know, and it's, you know, and I'm, what's he, 35, 36? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, that's, relatively speaking, not young, not old. I mean, there's certainly a lot of players, but, but you know, so, sometimes guys get old when they're 33. I mean, sometimes, you know, sometimes it can happen really quick. So I think the, the correct answer you were supposed to say, though, is their batting average would be much higher if they were swinging the Rawlings bat. Oh, okay. That's the answer. Really <laughs> so, yes. That's probably the truth. Yes. But, yeah, when, as far as equipment, those guys pay attention to so many things, and a half an ounce can make a difference or an inch or a length, and, and they're constantly talking about where the weight is in the bat. Yeah. Exactly. You know, if, if the weight's in the handle or the weight's in the barrel, or I mean, those guys are constantly tweaking everything. So, yes, I'm sure he's looking at his bat. I'm sure he's looking at everything to try to figure out what's going to – Produce the quickest swing speed through the zone. Yes. Do you think it's a good a good thing for the Cardinal schedule since we're starting in the checkbook team, you know, and then we go and play the Padres? That it's better that it's warmer for them now because it seems like in the past we've come home and we've played in the snow or we've gone to Milwaukee or yeah. Cincinnati and it's been so cold and they've been down in Florida. I'll let you know in a week. <laughs> uh, no, I, yeah, I mean, I think it, the, the good weather definitely helps. You know, I mean, I think as far as that is uh, that is that is concerned because yeah, early April and say, well, you never know what the weather's going to be like. It could be really good. It could be really bad. So it's and we've seen we've seen all different you know conditions. 
Uh, but especially when they're used to being in warm weather, I think, you know, that, but let's put it this way, there's more or less excuse that they'll have. Right. You know, if, if they Although it is early, you still need, these games are important, right? Any game against the Dodgers are important. So, yes, it's early, but this is, you know, not a time you want to get off to a slow start. We say the standings don't matter in April, but, you know, these are games that you want to win. Who's willing to bet on Otani having a good year? <laughs> sure, <they're> there. <laughs> yeah, so no, it's, it's just, you know, and, and that's interesting too. I mean, you know, obviously there's a distraction going on with the Dodgers that, uh, you know, nobody really kind of counted on uh, happening a week ago. So you never know how that's going to affect uh, somebody on the physically or mentally on the field as well. So, And that's the thing too about, about baseball is, is that, you know, we look at the performance and we want these guys to be um, successful all the time or not successful if on the, on the team that you're playing against. But you don't take into account some of the things sometimes. You don't know what their personal life is, deal with issues that they're dealing with. You don't know what other things are going on in their life. So you sometimes can have to forget that they're human beings too. And it's maybe we're a little too hard, too quick to judge them and, and uh, you know, rate their performance when they may have other stuff going on that we're not aware of. All right, tennis, anybody have final questions? All right, we've got more tickets to give away. These will be the red tickets. So it's over there. So we've got, um, there's four, four games in April that we have tickets for that we're going to give away. And you'll have to just, uh, get, we'll give you a piece of paper. You get Sally the information with your email. We'll get them to you on the ballpark app. The first game that we have tickets for is next month, or not next month, but Monday, April 8th, so 6.45 start against the Phillies, two tickets to that game. And we're gonna give those to winning number. One, and just a red ticket, six, eight, seven is the last three numbers. Bernie, what again? What? <laughs> Bernie's on the, on, the, uh, on the roll here. All right, the red, so the red tickets to the next one, this is a day game.